All right, guys. So we are talking about a couple different movements here um, this week. We're going to be starting with the Vienna Succession, um, which is the sort of um, Austrian version of Art Nouveau. That's very much kind of in line with the French um, Art Nouveau with some sort of some um, connections to German Art Nouveau as well. And you'll see that in some of the design um, elements I'll show you from the um, Vienna Succession. Um, don't forget we were just talking about the arts and crafts movement as well as Art Nouveau. Um, and then we're moving into this conversation um, about um, the Vienna Succession, which is very much part of this. And then we're going to talk about um, Expressionism and Fauvism. So this was an art movement formed in 1980. 1897 by a group of Austrian artists who had resigned from the Association of Australian Artists housed at the Vienna Kunstler House. Uh, painters and sculptors and architects all did this and they objected to the prevailing conservatism of the Kunstler House and orientation towards historicism. And they wanted to provide in Vienna a dedicated space for art in the city. They are much, very much forward-thinking internationalists. Um, they were all-encompassing, embraced the integration of genres and fields highly idealistically, freed from the dictates of entrenched values, prevailing commercial tastes. Um, and then they also campaigned against nationalism in art, so kind of moving away from these very specific sort of themes and ideas. Um... The main artist that we're going to talk about in this movement is Gustav Klimt, who you're probably familiar with, um, and then we'll move on to sort of talk about um, other elements of this time as well. Um, so they built this structure um, as the sort of emblem of their um, manifesto, the succession building. Um, and it really came to sort of embody all these characteristics they believed in, such as sort of delicate foliage, classical themes and sculptures. You have this um, dome that's all done in um, this like gold gilted leaf um, that really sort of adds this massive pop to the city. And it becomes this sort of emblem of um, the succession in um, Austria. You can see that the, the leaves here on the building. It's about 3,000 um, gilted leaves, and this building would have been seen from afar. It would draw in your attention. So it was very important, very valuable um, to this group of artists. You can see some of the influence of um, Art Nouveau on design in some of these um, pieces of advertisement that I um, put up here. And you can like really see those characteristics coming through and also even that connection to kind of modernism um, and also like Woodstock that we were looking at. So that sort of text and font um, that's very sort of Art Nouveau inspired or inspired and created by Art Nouveau. And Egon Schiel even gets involved. This is his poster on the right. Okay, so Gustav Klimt, um, he is um, a very famous artist at this time. He very much led um, the group and um, helped encourage utilizing this sort of decorative aspect in art and art making, um, as well as architecture. And um, he loved his cat. He's <laughs> These pictures of him with his cat in these like smocks are pretty sort of um, infamous for him. Um, he was also a womanizer. Um, the closest relationship he had in his lifetime was with his sister-in-law, um, Emile Flage. Flage. Um, we don't know if their relationship was ever more than um, platonic. However, there seems to be some implication that they were sort of together. Um, and he painted her quite often. Um, this was the funny little quote I found in an article that was, Klimp loved cats, but not as much as he loved women. Um, he had something like 14 illegitimate children over his life, um, and he only acknowledged four of them. Um, he 
really didn't sort of respect women or appreciate them entirely. Um, but at the same time, painted women and made these like sort of gorgeous paintings of women. So there's there's some interesting dichotomy there um, in who he is as an artist and sort of what his um, art represents. Also, there's a one man show about him um, called The Portrait that came out in 2016, which seems weird. So him, as well as other artists from this period, were very interested and inspired by um, the Byzantine era and this sort of use of mosaics um, and gold. And so like um, it, the interior of St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, Italy is a really good example of that because it's all covered in this gold mosaic that is really very powerful when you're in this space. It doesn't, you can't do it justice kind of in the, um, when looking at it here, you can see the light shining off of all the mosaics in this um, church. It's quite fantastic. Um, between 1907 and 1908, he perfected this golden style um, that would become famous in his works and very much inspired by this. Um, utilizing gold leaf so with works like the kiss which we're going to talk about in a second um this gold leaf was applied to um the paintings to give it that um gold aura and if you know anything about gold leaf it's kind of a pain to work with um, and he was doing it quite frequently at this time it was called the golden style and he was also inspired, obviously, by arts and crafts as well, as well as Art Nouveau. Um, but it also comes from this sort of longer historical um, imagery. So this is The Kiss, um, a very famous painting. You've probably seen it before. Um, it is an intricate ornamental um, image. It depicts a couple kneeling in a grassy patch of wildflowers, in geometrically printed robes, and a crown of vines. Um, on his head specifically for the man and she has sort of flowers in her hair um there are multiple interpretations of this work i discovered um a while back which i always thought was interesting because i feel like this work is definitely taken as this sort of sweet um gentle moment and so this is sort of the typical interpretation of this work which is that the woman calmly wraps her arms around her partner's neck, eyes peacefully closed, emphasizing tranquility and intimacy of the scene. So it's supposed to be this sort of very intimate moment between a couple, kind of like metaphoric for love. However, um, I have also read interpretations that have said, um, not evident at first glance is the tension between the couple's physical relationship. Most noticeable is the way that the woman's head is forced uncomfortably against her shoulder. Their position is dangerously close to the edge of the precipice, further unsettles the initial impression for those willing to look further in this beautiful, in the beautiful surface. Um, so this, that she's not actually sort of happy about it, but kind of trying to pull him away, that she looks uncomfortable, um, and that she's like kneeling at this precipice. So the interpretation still seems um, up for debate, and it kind of depends on like whether or not you um, sort of agree that there's something un inherently uncomfortable about this um, painting. And I think that there is some uncomfortability, but it's hard to tell if that is more sort of um, my opinion or that it's something that comes off in the painting. Um, it's hard to say. I guess that would be my opinion, but you get the gist. The next work um, by Klimt is this portrait of Adele Block Bauer, um, which is in another one using a lot of that gold leaf. And um, it's also been called the Lady in Gold or the Woman in Gold. Um, it was commissioned by the sitter's husband, Ferdinand Blockbauer, who was a Jewish banker and sugar producer. Um, hopefully you have uh, seen the film on this painting because it's really powerful. But again, he's using this mosaic um, patterning with the gold and the shapes um, as well. Here's Adele Blockbauer. Um, so in Women in Gold, um, this work, um, the portrait of Adele Blockbauer, is stolen by the Nazis in 1941 and displayed at the Belvedere. So the Belvedere get their hands on it and 
during sort of the reparations that occur um, after World War II. And by this time, the Blockbauers have passed away, the, the aunt and uncle. And um, she had sort of donated it to the Belvedere. However, there's some legal issues and also having to do with sort of the Nazis and that um, the because they died at the hands of the Nazis, there's no way for them to have known what was going to happen and um, they wouldn't have necessarily given it to this museum, etc. So I have given you that you can do an extra credit assignment um, to watch this film and then write about it because it's a really fantastic film. Um, Helen Mirren and um, Ryan Reynolds do a great job in it and it's a true story. So um, I won't try to tell you, I won't tell you the ending of it. Um, in case you want to watch the film, um, but, um, it's a happy ending. <laughs> um, but this, um, painting really became powerful. And when it was in the Belvedere, um, the city, I think it was in Austria, um, they would talk about how, um, she became the symbol of the city and people thought that she was like emblematic of Austria and of Vienna. And that if you took her away, that it would, um, be heartbreaking to the people. Um, and you have here Helen Mirren playing um, her niece, the niece of um, Adele Blockbauer, and um, saying that, yes, maybe these people like see her as this emblem of something, but she's my aunt. She's someone I knew. She was like my, you know, my one of my favorite people and she died. And like, I wasn't able to have like these moments with her. Um, and she's not some, just some metaphor, you know, to her. Um, and so it brings up a lot of interesting questions about reparations during World War II um, and where works of art went um, and also like what happened to Jewish families when the Nazis came in and stole their work and objects um, such as this uh, choker that is in the painting here, um, which was owned by Adele Blockbauer um, and in the film she gives it to um, her niece this is um helen mirren the niece um but it becomes this kind of emblem as well of um their relationship and she wears it at her wedding um the niece does but even this necklace was stolen by the nazis um during this time in the 40s and worn by um herman goring's wife um emmy and so you can see sort of this train of like you're not only sort of stealing right their objects and the things that are wealthy, but then like wearing them and inhabiting their lives. It's very dark to sort of think about um, all these elements of the story. The work is also very much um, really kind of the epitome of um, Klimt's gold phase. Uh, he really kind of, this is kind of the final painting in that series and really is kind of very emblematic of it. Um, he, this is also one of the only people he painted twice. Um, he painted her again in a slimmer portrait, um, which, um, here, I'll pause it and bring it up for you guys here. Here's the other portrait of um, Adele Blockbauer. This one, let's see, 1912. This one is after um, the um, gold one. So he's moved on to a different period of his art style, but here she is again. So like I said, you are welcome to um, do that extra credit assignment. Uh, it'll be available until the end of March to complete.